Something even longtime subscribers to my channel might not know before, or perhaps somewhat coincidental with the beginning of my commercial photography career, I was a sought after <laughs> fashion model. It's true, I'm living proof, along with Kate Moss, that you don't absolutely have to be six feet tall to make it to Milan, at least to the pages of outdoor gear catalogs. And that's where I first made my big splash <laughs> in various Vancouver outdoor catalogs that were produced by friends and colleagues and that I'd go on to shoot for any number of clients, including Mountain Equipment Co-op. I prided myself on knowing all the details, lap felled seams, a thread count, and so on, of all the clothing I recommended as a salesperson. So in this video, I'll try to offer advice, the fundamentals of which haven't really changed since we um, shed <laughs> our fur. Starting at the top, which is important because most heat is lost through the scalp. <laughs> Probably all in my case. You can wear a toque or a ball cap under a hood or a sou'wester. Mine's a genuine industrial strength west coast sou'wester. Still today, the best approach to dressing for inclement weather is to use layers. And the base layer truly is comprised of foundation garments. <laughs> when it comes to photography, unless you're actively, say, climbing or skiing, anything that causes you to perspire, staying warm is more of a concern. Still, I recommend a base layer that'll wick away moisture. And I'll leave it up to you whether that's a man-made or natural fiber, polyester or merino wool. I was also around for the first polypropylene underwear made by now famous companies like uh, <laughs> Smelly Hansen, as we used to refer to them. And anyone who wore that stuff on a long expedition will get the joke. Jacket. I was around for the birth of Gore-Tex. We got a bolt at a, another outdoor shop that I worked at, and I got a few meters to sew my own climbing ski pants. Though those early iterations had a habit of delaminating, the water-repellent breathable membrane has become a sort of generic name for rain gear shells, and pants. Supplanting traditional clothing like oilskins that fishers relied on to keep dry. Even so, those older garments had some advantages that really haven't been surpassed, like durability. My first climbing anorak, before I switched to Gore-Tex, was made from tried and true Egyptian cotton, which relied on frequent treatments of silicone, or wax. And apparently the idea is making a comeback, or I don't know, maybe it never went away. For all kinds of clothing. I've been out of the outdoor clothing loop for a few years, so I hadn't heard of Fjallraven. Well, maybe heard of, but unfamiliar with. And I'm not sure I can pronounce it properly. But every best of review puts their clothing, particularly technical pants, at the top of the list. I've made no secret of my disapproval of the recent privatization of the co-op. Now it's called Mountain Equipment company. And I've avoided shopping there since the takeover. But Google pointed me there and swallowing my pride, I drove into town to grab one of the last pairs they had in stock. Not the exact color I wanted. And when I got home, I realized that they were way too long for my short legs. My inseam is shy of 30 inches or what is that? 76 centimeters. They have these uh, boot fasteners and tighteners, so you can't just turn them up as I have to do for all my pants. Back to Google and Fjall Robin's website, turns out they have a store literally across the street from MEC in Victoria. How did I miss it? They make a short version, so another trip to town where I return the trousers to MEC. Even though the Fjall Robin store also didn't have the short version in stock, they did have a sewing machine and seamstresses in store, and I got my preferred color. I also sprang for a very expensive $15 block of their Greenland wax. The trousers come pre-treated, but as an initial preemptive strike, and for fun, I applied a generous coat to the reinforced knees and butt. You can heat it in with either an iron or hair dryer. I opted for the hair dryer. The wax melts readily into the wind and water resistant G1000 fabric, which is a mix of 65% polyester, 35% cotton. 
It felt like the old days when I used to spend hours preparing for a climb, waxing my boots and <laughs> filing my crampons. The knee reinforcements double as knee pad holders. I made mine out of some closed cell foam I had hanging around. Then these can be inserted into the pouches and voila, your knees are protected while you kneel <laughs> on the pebble beach trying to get that blue heron shot. For the second layer, again, choose natural or man-made fiber depending on the temperature and activity level. I'll often wear a full zippered jacket that can be vented under my rainproof layer. This video is about dressing for rain, so we'll assume the temperature is above freezing, whether Fahrenheit or Celsius. But obviously, if you're in the Rockies in midwinter, you're more likely to be wearing a down parka than a rain shell. Here on the wet coast, tradition calls for slickers and sou'westers. As I say, I've been wearing Gore-Tex for going on five decades. There are other brands of breathable membrane. We just tend to refer to them generally by the original material developed by Wilbert and Robert Gore. Everyone's needs will be different, but it's important to have plenty of pockets and that the seams are factory sealed. Remember when you had to do that at home with some kind of noxious goo? And then there's underarm zippers to vent perspiration when you're active. If you're spending hours sitting in a blind or on a windy river, you'll be more interested in just staying warm. Don't underestimate how chilled you can get in those circumstances. Again, layering is the way to go. Be like a scout, <laughs> be prepared. Shivering is not conducive to accurate tracking and focusing. I have regular rain pants, nothing fancy, just coated nylon, and they're okay for non-active wear, but they're pretty flimsy as far as abrasion resistance, and they're very noisy. I also carry gaiters, a holdover from mountaineering. They're important in snow and really deep muck. Keep your socks clean and really keep that snow and mud out of your boots. When it comes to boots, some people prefer wellies, gum boots, whatever you want to call them. I most often use hiking boots. Today's are more water resistant than ever and give ankle support, which is really important to me with one that doesn't function so well. Ankle I'm talking about, not boots. If I'm really anticipating a dip in the sea or other body of water, chest waders are the way to go. And as far as socks, again, I like a wicking layer against the skin and an insulation layer outside, usually wool no cotton. Hands. <laughs> now there's plenty of photography specific gloves and mittens available from companies like Valore and the Heat Company. They're good. What you choose again will depend on temperatures where you live. I have a few different options. Some claim to be touchscreen compatible. In my experience they aren't. For the most part I press my cycling gloves and mitts into service. Although I have to brave the cold I, I will admit to use the camera's functions most of the time. Another old climbing skiing tip, in sub-zero conditions, use thin liner gloves underneath your other mitts or gloves. When it comes to photography bags, packs and cases, there's too many options to cover here, and it'll depend on your needs. Backpacks are really the option most suited to this kind of situation, and none are waterproof. Amanda bought me this one, for my birthday about 15 years ago and it's built better than a lot of newer bags. I recall a model with sealed zippers that came out a while after but however well sealed these backpacks claim to be, most come with a rain cover. I have a couple at hand. This one fits the bag almost perfectly. If you're looking for an absolute waterproof solution, Pelican type cases are the only way to go. I use one for my wireless audio kit and as I demonstrated a while back, the wireless Go can receive a signal with the case closed. <laughs> case closed. <laughs> Dry bags can also come in handy and I keep a few around especially for use out on the water. Last but certainly not least, what about dressing your gear during use? Your expensive cameras and lenses are not waterproof unless they're in a housing. Some cameras are more weather resistant than others. Uh, case in point, I'm not sure any other system would have fared better under the circumstances, but fellow countryman Photo Tripper, who recently uh, traded the rains of Vancouver Island for the equally damp and way more ass freezing winters of the East Coast, he was recently out in a maritime hurricane. His Sony camera, fitted with a lens, um, I'm not a Sony expert, so I don't know which model, but one with external focusing, maybe zoom, 
and the whole system just up and quit. <laughs> to the smug delight <laughs> of Canon and Nikon fans. Thing is, as I say, the best camera is not waterproof without a housing, only weather sealed. And that's a kind of imprecise term. So if it's raining cats and dogs, your camera needs a rain jacket too. Here's mine from Raincoat. I've had this for about 10 years and it's protected my gear in the most atrocious weather. Mind you, <laughs> the cameras and lenses have all been Nikon. Seriously though, unless you have a flagship type camera like the Nikon D6 or Z9 or Canon RS, dress it appropriately. It's really important not to expose them to really wet conditions. My Nikon Z6s, for instance, get babied much more. The battery compartments and car doors are not as well sealed as the Z9. Enough said, but even flagships deserve protection in a storm, unless <laughs> you're Morton Hilmer. You know, actually, we don't need this right now. It was just, it really was pouring cats and dogs when we arrived here. As soon as I set up, it stopped raining and it's actually turned into quite a nice day. You can now hear the waves rolling onto the shore. It's very calming. So do you have any tips for shooting in inclement weather? Please do add them to the soggy knowledge base in the comments below. Well, I hope you found this video useful or entertaining. If you did, please do give it the old thumbs up so YouTube might recommend it to others. And if this is your first time here, please do consider subscribing. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. In the meantime, take care of yourself. Cheers and I actually want this to be the other way around, but in this case I wanted it to rain during the presentation. As soon as I pack up, it starts to rain again. <laughs> oh well, you take what you can get I guess. Again, take care of yourselves, cheers, and we'll see you later.